invitation to come and talk here this evening. It's a real privilege to be here. And uh, also, thank you for your wonderful introduction. It's so complete, so comprehensive, that really there's nothing much more that needs to be said. However, I can say a little bit more. Um, I thought that uh, what I'd do is just look at some of the glitches that there are in our current view. Um, I'm a child of the 60s. Actually, I'm a little bit before the 60s. But, um, essentially, when I was starting in research, it was in the 60s. And there were lots of substances around then which were mind-bending and expanding consciousness. And consciousness, as far as people were concerned, was very much uh, on the agenda. But even more interesting than that, uh, it was the time when the Beatles were there. Do you remember the Maharishi? Mahesh Yogi came from India and taught the Beatles how to meditate. And one of the first uh, papers on meditation was one that, I, that uh, I did. And I was very lucky to get George Harrison to come along and sit under my electrodes. And we could measure him when he meditated. <laughs> and in fact, I had hoped that uh, that particular session would produce my pension, because an EEG is many, many sheets of paper. And I thought I could sell George Harrison's uh, <laughs> um, uh, EEG waves. But unfortunately, somebody got there before me. <laughs> uh, they were taken. So w what I want to look at is uh, the brain identity theory. Now, the brain identity theory is just one half of what Sam has been talking about. Can the brain really be said to create consciousness for us? And it goes into this question, is, is it all mind or is it all body? And so if it's all body, um, are the brain-based uh, explanations satisfactory? Well, yes, they are to some extent. Um, we, for example, uh, in, this, in this picture here, you can see the brain unfolded. You can see the layers of cells in the cortex and you can see uh, the actual cellular structure itself. Now, as Schrodinger said, if you look at what mankind or humankind does, you see these wonderful creations, but just go into the skull and what you find? Porridge. And how does this porridge create consciousness? Wonderful structures, billions of cells, but you have to get from that to consciousness. Uh, it's a lovely painting. You can see how they're all entangled with each other and twisted with each other, and they all communicate with each other. And the question is, at what level? Because our concepts in neuroscience now are changing fast. We've gone from just limited areas to systems. We're now, in fact, beginning to go into whole brain activity at the time. But the way that neuroscience is advancing is it's advancing through the slow methods of blood flow, uh, whereas there are some faster methods, which I think will come to dominate in, in a few years' time. Cells talk together. They communicate <coughs> through electrical impulses. Is this really the substance of consciousness? Brain cells have memories. Is that related to our memory? Because as Sam has pointed out, if you really can have a memory after you've been unconscious, and have acquired new information, is it in the cell memories or not? Brain cells are grouped into systems by shape and size and layers, by chemical neurotransmitters, by location, and by functional systems. These certainly neuroscience knows about. But if you have uh, a, conscious, a conscious state, particularly in some of the wide conscious states, you get very different areas in the brain which become active in it. Now, how are all those areas linked together? How is it that you can have one unitary consciousness of the self when yet the, the substance which supports it or the systems which are supports, supports it are so diverse? It's uh, very much a problem that needs yet to be sorted out. So we understand some systems. And let me give you an example of one such system which we do understand, uh, and that is to do with the creation of the body image. You all know this uh, picture of the brain, the frontal lobe, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, occipital lobes. And uh, the, our understanding of how uh, various functions and structures 
are placed within these lobes is now enormous and just wonderful. The whole idea of the theory of mind areas in the front there, that which makes us human, has been a very important discovery uh, just coming up to the year 2000. The idea of uh, the body image and how you can train the body image. I can get you all to have an out-of-body experience with no difficulty at all. I can train you to put yourself outside your body. This can all be done very easily. And there's some nice papers published by some Japanese workers which show that. Um, memory is very comprehensive and emotion in the amygdala and the hippocampus is uh, very important. And we now know that learning takes place during sleep. And there's a relationship between these structures and how the information is spread throughout the brain. And I just want to concentrate on one particular area. I want to talk about vision. And remember, it's at the back of the brain here. And I want